When Jesus appeared before Pilate, for a few minutes, the truth as to the nature of it was discussed. When Jesus, in John 18, 37, claimed to bear witness to the truth, it was Pilate who raised the perennial question, what is truth? Verse 38. I think we live in a world that every day gets more into the way that Pilate thought and that so many in the pagan world, if not all, thought about truth. In other words, so many people today sound like Pilate when you begin to talk about truth. There is a research group called the Barna Research Group that did a survey on what Americans believe. And they asked the question, is there absolute truth? Is there absolute truth? They found that 66% of adults responded that they believe that there is no such thing as absolute truth. Different people can define truth in conflicting ways and still be correct. 72% of those aged 18 to 25 expressed this belief. That's an amazing thing. In a series of more than 20 interviews conducted at random at a large university, people were asked if there was such a thing as absolute truth. Truth that is true across all times and cultures for all people, and so on. All but one respondent answered along these lines. All but one. Truth is whatever you believe. There is no absolute truth. If there were such a thing as absolute truth, how could we know what it is? And people who believe in absolute truth are dangerous. I think that if you keep up with what goes on in current events, that it's not hard to see the results of that kind of thinking in our American society today and in Western society in general. We who preach that truth is objective, it's just what it is, it's outside of us, it doesn't depend upon us, it has nothing to do with my filtering it, just what it is, who, who teach that it's absolute, find ourselves in very much the minority, and yet there's no way to preach the gospel and not believe in absolute objective truth. So what is the Christian perspective regarding truth? Is truth whatever you believe? Can we know that truth is absolute? So let's do a little study along this line, not that you're not unfamiliar with this, but to be reminded and to give emphasis to what we might say is the truth about truth. Truth always corresponds with reality. That's one of the views of truth. Truth always corresponds to reality. Now think about that for a moment. That's the reason a lie is so bad. It doesn't correspond with reality. In effect, it is intellectually going crazy. To tell a lie is to tell about that which does not correspond with reality. So in philosophy, you just simply call this the correspondence view of truth. A statement is true if and only if it corresponds to or agrees with factual reality. A fact is just what it is. When you get all the facts pertaining to a case together, reason correctly with it, you arrive at the truth. You cannot arrive at the truth if you don't. We used to say, have your ducks all in order. Have your facts together. 
So this view presupposes a law of logic called the law of bivalence. Any unambiguous declarative statement must be either true or false. It cannot be either neither true nor false. It just can't. Nor can it be both true and false. Uh, this is a microphone, and at the same time in the same place, it's a potato. There's something wrong with that. I'll carry it further. I am standing in front of you. Is that a fact? Well, is it the truth? It's true only if, in fact, I am standing in front of you. Now, who made us to grasp facts and to reason with them and draw conclusions? Who made us to be able to do that? Right now, as you listen to my words, are you trying to understand them? As I speak these words, am I trying to say them in a way that's coherent and systematic so that you who are made a certain way by God to understand can understand them if you do your part to understand them? The Bible. I like that little thing that shows up on Facebook from time to time. One frame in a cartoon has, Lord, speak to me. And the next frame is a hand coming down from heaven handing the Bible. He has spoken. God who at sundry times and divers manners spake in time past to the fathers by the prophets hath in these last days spoken unto us by his son. So, a thing's true only if, in fact, concerning I'm standing in front of you, that I am standing in front of you. It must be the true or false. It cannot be both true or false and false as I stand here now. The correspondence view of truth holds that propositional or declarative statements are subject to verification and falsification. True or false. I am standing in front of you now. Now if you have to be <laughs> so much involved in this that you have to define I and am and standing in and front of you, you can do that. But it's so simple in our communication with one another to explain certain things, you don't need to go into that. It's self-explanatory. I am standing in front of you. Now, can that both be true and false? No, it can't. A statement can be proven false if it can be shown to disagree with objective reality. Now, am I a figment of your imagination? Well, it reminds me one time in a philosophy class where a student had held the view that it really didn't exist. So when he turned his paper his test paper, into the professor. He asked the professor, do I exist? And the professor looked up at him over his glasses and said, who wants to know? I think I would have flunked him right there. It reminds me also of one person said, why don't you give me an F on this paper? And the teacher said, because I didn't have any lower grade to give you. So in that case, you'd get the lowest one that's possible to give. The statement, the world is flat, that's either true or false. Cannot be both. Photographs from space have falsified flat earth claims. I remember one time when we had to take a course on uh, educational administration and graduate work up at uh, Oklahoma State University. We had to act like a college administrator and there had to be uh, some problem of taking place and we were facing the news media. Well, they tried to make it as real as they could because they got the, the, the journalism students of the paper of Oklahoma State University to come and interview us. And we had to be either a dean or head of the department or a vice president or something like that or president. And we had to answer 
their questions. And of course, they were doing their best to be, you know, good journalists really are. And uh, I remember, I don't, I don't even remember what they were asking me. But I was trying to make a point that this is, this is the case. Whatever it was, I was saying, this is the case. And in doing so, I said, you know, there's either oil directly beneath my feet or there is not. I do not know all it takes to prove that there's oil or not oil directly beneath my feet. But that's a true or false statement. It's the nature of truth. And if you're asking me about whatever it was they were asking me about, then I'm telling you what the truth is. And that was the point of the whole thing. So this view of truth was held by the vast majority of philosophers and theologians throughout history until recently. Now recently, it's quite a few years, but still recently, comparatively speaking, when you talk about the history of philosophy and theology. That's one view. That, I think, is the truth about truth. That facts must correspond with reality. Now it's interesting when you talk about emotional problems and mental problems, actually, psychologically speaking, a person who is distancing himself or herself from reality is a person who's got a mental problem. Now nobody ever completely disjoins himself or herself from reality. But they can get so, I'll just use a common word uh, or term, spaced out, <laughs> that they are not facing the reality of the facts in their lives to the point of dealing with them as this is real to you and you can't ignore it. But one of the things that we like to do is practice escapism. We like to run from the facts. There are a host of people out there today that do not want to face the facts in their lives. And those who do face the facts sometimes are scared out of their wits at the facts they face and they're real good at running. And so, husband, wife, problems come along. They face the facts. There are problems. Look what they're going to demand to get these things worked out. And the easiest thing to do is zip, just take off. Run away from them. Leave it all behind. Say, oh, I'm free of that. No more problems with me. No matter what kind of problems you create for everybody else, there's no more problems for me. That's the height and the depth and the breadth of selfishness. That's all that is. And when you study the Bible and Christian living, then you see that's the reason he that would be greatest among you, let him be your servant, because that's a person who faces the facts and solves the problems, no matter how menial and low they are and how hard they are. But the other is what we mentioned earlier. Truth is relative and not objective. It's not absolute. And this is just simply called the relativist view of truth. What is true depends on the views of persons or cultures. Does that sound familiar nowadays? I remember in the recent um, uh, hearings chief uh, for the uh, court, Supreme Court Justice that one of the fellows on there said, now we've heard her truth, now let's hear his truth. Well, I put all sorts of anti up in there. Flags were flying all over the place. I knew what that man meant. I knew exactly what he was talking about. He was saying that truth is dependent upon the person. And when you've got somebody like that, you shouldn't trust him. Her either. Or anybody else. So such as this, that truth depends on the views of persons or certain cultures, not on whether statements correspond to objective reality, then you've got big problems all up and down society. I don't know how you'd figure out what a lie is because a lie is opposite from the truth. There would never really be any lies if you took the position I just mentioned to you to its ultimate logical conclusion in every case. For a, test, for a statement to be true simply means that a person or culture believes it to be true. Uh, let's take, for example, uh, World War II, the Japanese and the beliefs uh, that they had in Harry Carey. Uh, the suicide pilots and so forth. Must have been true that their culture accepted that kind of thing. So it was true. 
Now, if you remember, or you've heard others speak of it, at the Nuremberg trials, the Nazis tried that. They said, you as allies are judging our country to be wrong in what it did. But you have a different standard of laws from what Germany did under Hitler and the Nazis. And the chief prosecutor, who happened to be a Supreme Court Justice of the United States, said there's a higher law. There's a higher law than just the laws men make for their countries. But if you're going to follow the view that truth is relative and not absolute, then what you do is make the law of the land the supreme being or whatever you want to call it. Just simply make the state as the one that determines what is right and wrong. So if the state rules that it's all right to kill unborn babies, that's right. That's true. There's nothing wrong with that. That's good. Because the state has the power, and it said that it's all right to do it. If that's true for you, people will say like this, then fine. Uh, we can't judge other cultures, or that's your truth fellow who is a poet, Steve Turner, wrote a parody of this attitude and called it Creed. And in part he said, I believe that each man must find the truth that is right for him. Reality will adapt accordingly. The universe will readjust. History will alter. I believe that there is no absolute truth excepting the truth that there is no absolute truth. Which, of course, is the thing that you ought to hit these guys with. There's no absolute truth, Gary. So, so you're down here in the front. You have to get the brunt of this. So you're the fellow representing there is no absolute truth. And my question will be, are you absolutely sure? And if you say, yes, I'm absolutely sure, then you have contradicted yourself. There's at least one absolute truth, and that is that there is no absolute truth. And down falls the whole thing. At least it does to people who are rational in their thinking. But we have to recognize we're in a world that's not very rational. I saw one the other day that says to the president, you are not welcome in this community, and in the very next breath, we accept everybody in this community. Now you figure that one out. I don't care what you think about the president. You figure that one out. I mean, said just that fast and just that way. How are you going to reason with people like this? How are you going to teach on any subject? I don't care what the topic is. How are you going to do it? Where do you begin? Well, one way you could begin is to round them all up and put them in a nut house and isolate them from everybody else. But that's not going to happen because there's too many people controlling whether that does happen or not. And the one that's out will be the one that's liable to be rounded up will be the folks that believe in absolute truth. That's exactly what it comes down to. When truth is deemed dependent upon the person or culture holding the belief, then you know the answer. Anything becomes true. Anything becomes true. For example, one person can say Jesus is deity. Another can say that Allah is deity. And they're both right. That is actually and real. You can't say Allah doesn't exist. That that is a false god. You can't say that God does not exist. While at the same time saying he does exist. And mean the same God. But in this view we're talking about, and it's basically postmodernism, what it's called, then you can. So all of these statements would be true if they accurately express the sentiments of the speakers. This view seems to advance tolerance and civility. At least that's what we're told. But it does so at the expense of your rational powers to use actually to exclude logical thinking. 
The very definition of deity precludes the possibility that all I've just mentioned are true. Those who say there's no absolute truth make decisions every day based on things they believe are true or false. And here's some examples. They turn on a light believing in the reality of electricity. In fact, I'd say the hard sciences aren't affected by this as much because of just such a thing as that. They turn on a light believing in electricity. They drive a car believing in the effectiveness of the engine. No one flying would want to be directed by a navigator who did not believe in the truth of his instruments. I thought it was a funny one if you saw on Halloween. They said this man has captured all the Halloween tricks. And it was a pilot dressed in his uniform walking through the airport with sunglasses on with his blind man stick. Well, if he believes that truth is relative and subjective, wouldn't you go ahead and fly with him? You wouldn't want to hurt his feelings. Some things are just more than absurd. No one undergoing brain surgery you want to be operated on by a surgeon who did not believe that some things about the brain were true and some not. If there are no absolutes, then, of course, as I said earlier, there are no right, absolute right and wrong, no objective right or wrong. I can kill you. I can steal from you. I can lie to you, and you can't say anything is wrong about it. Now, you look at some of the stuff that's being done nowadays, and you see how much that stuff is being believed in the way they're responding to certain things done in this country. Because if I believe I should do such things as I just mentioned and succeed, then it works for me, and it has become my personal truth, and who are you to judge me? In the absence of truth, power is the only game left in town. Now think, think, think what you're witnessing every day in this country. Despite its absurdity, this view of truth has become the darling of all who want to be free to do their own thing. And part of their own thing is to make everybody else by coercion if they can, submit to them as they do their own thing. Because what that says is, is that we're free to do our own thing, and you're free to do our own thing. <laughs> That's what it says. That's all the freedom you have, is that you're free to do what we tell you to do. And we're free to knock you in the head if you don't. That's been around for a long time. But because we've lived in a nation for, and in the Western world for a long time that could see through that, then we haven't had to face it as we are now because there's a great many people who accept all this garbage. And they're living by it or attempting to. And that's the reason you can say you're not welcome here. We welcome everybody. And that person is as dingy as can be. But don't know it. They don't know it. They see no contradiction in what they thought and what they said. You know, one of the things that has gone a long way in helping this develop in the minds of people, and they would never admit it, is the denominational system. It says, you go to your church, and I'll go to mine. We'll all get to heaven together. Or it really doesn't make any difference what you believe, just so you're sincere. Well, they applied that originally to religious matters. But just a generation or so later says, well, if that's the way it works in religious matters, why wouldn't it work that way in moral matters? And so you see some of this happening. Why couldn't I take the position when it comes to morality? It really doesn't make any difference what we believe just so you're sincere in the believing of it. So if you're sincere homosexually, homosexual, that's right. If you're a sincere child molester, that's right. 
And does that sound familiar with the way some people are going nowadays? And everybody that opposes that becomes ogres and backward and mossbacks and nuts. Well, what does that do to the church of Jesus Christ as that term is defined and used in the New Testament? What does that do to each Christian as you labor to keep a godly family based upon the absolute standards of right and wrong set out in God's Word for He created marriage in the family and regulates it? What does that do to dealing with people in general when you have to deal with folks like this? The biblical view of truth needs to be understood because we have historically as Christians and that term used in the Bible defined and used it affirmed the correspondence view of truth as I said earlier for good reasons because it is consistent with the biblical view of truth biblical words are truth all scripture is given by inspiration of God and it's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto every good work. 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed. Listen, rightly dividing the word of truth. Father, sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. Now, if you take the view that truth is relative, what sense do those verses, very common to us, make? Why even have a spiritual constitution? Is it fluid? Well, a lot of religions would try to make it so with their manuals, creeds, prayer books, conferences, and synods. The Roman Catholic Church says the magisterium, the teaching arm of the church, composed of the Pope and his bishops, plus the Bible, constitute the authority of the church, which means then they are set to change whatever they want to change because they think they're the position of the apostles. And thus the Holy Spirit guides the Pope and his councils to keep the Bible updated to fit today. After all, this is a 2,000-year-old book. can't be updated. So they're there to update it for us. Men have tried every way under the sun to do it. And the folks who believe in postmodernism and believe that truth is subjective and relative, they're doing the same thing. It makes man the measure of all things. And if you've got enough men together who believe that, they have the power to force everybody else into believing. And when Roman Catholicism had that power in Europe, in the medieval ages they controlled everything and if you stepped out of line then you were disposed of sanctimoniously and all that stuff so we've been there in the name of religion we've been there in a thousand years it was the dark ages as history records it in Europe Roman Catholic Church doesn't record it as the dark ages it calls it the glorious age of the church because they ran the whole show. There wasn't any king in Europe that didn't have the approval of the Pope. There wasn't anything going on that wasn't approved by Roman Catholicism or else it suffered. And I suggest to you sometimes it's good to read some of history of medieval Europe and you'll see just how they ran things. Well, nowadays, it's not the Roman Catholic Church, but it's people who believe what we've been talking about, that truth is subjective and relative. The biblical words of truth indicate an objective standard. You know, when you travel to different parts of the world and assemble with New Testament Christians, you always know what the worship is going to be about because they all have obeyed the same gospel and they all have organized the church the way the New Testament says, and they all worship the same way. But now if they believed that it all had to do with how each person thinks, you wouldn't find that in the world. There'd be no telling what going on wherever you went. 
You wouldn't even maybe see a name identifying the people who are assembling in a certain place remain the same. Why should it? The word true, alethes, unconcealed, manifest, actual, true, to fact, divine says. True, alethinos, denotes true in the sense of real, ideal, or genuine, again from thine. Aletheia, which is truth, objectively signifying the reality lying at the basis of an appearance, the manifested veritable essence of a matter, from a fellow by the name of Kramer. Subjectively, truthfulness, truth, not merely verbal, but sincerity and integrity of character. It is all speaking the truth being outside of the person not dependent upon one's own personal feelings about a matter. When the Bible speaks of truth, it describes that which corresponds to reality. What is factual and absolute and not relative. God is a God of truth. Moses said that in Deuteronomy chapter 32 and verse 4. Jesus is the truth and full of truth and spoke the truth. John 14, 6, John 1, 14 and chapter 8, verse 45. The Holy Spirit is the spirit of truth because of the main thing that he did, reveal the truth of the gospel to the world we have as the New Testament of Jesus Christ, the perfect law of liberty, James 1, verse 25. The word of God is truth, as I said earlier, John 17, 17. The judgments of God are according to truth, Psalm 96, verse 13. But it's echoed by Paul in Romans 2 and verse 2. Christians should walk in the truth as revealed by Jesus, including the standard of morality that he taught. Ephesians 4, 17 through 32, chapter 5, verses 1 through 17. Christians patiently teach others the truth. 2 Timothy 2, 23 through 26. And many will turn their ears away from the truth. 2 Timothy 4, verses 1 through 4. You see how in every case that I've read through identifies truth as a body over here independent of what you think or feel or male or female or wealthy or poor or whatever. There it is. Everybody's subject to it. So much more could be said as the Bible reveals the truth, but I think this is sufficient. What is truth? Truth is what is real. God is real. God reveals what is real. God is truth, and what he says is truth. Call yourself what you may, but you cannot be a Christian unless you hold the correspondence view of truth, that it corresponds with reality. You believe in moral absolutes of right and wrong. You accept Jesus and his word as the ultimate source of truth, especially in regards to morality and salvation. This is the kind of thing that we need to be saying to people all around us. We still have to deal with the denominationalism and the various churches and the false doctrines that we have for a long time. But the material I'm giving you today needs to be said more and more to our neighbors. And I think you'd be surprised at people that you've known for a good while who are not members of the Lord's church if you begin to deal with them on some of these matters, how you may run up against a roadblock. Don't judge me. That's your truth and so forth. And the sad part about it is, is if you don't watch out, it's going to get over into the church. And I know of nothing that will destroy the church of Christ. Remember, that's people off the face of the earth than people who hold a false view of truth. When you look at the Bible, and especially the New Testament, how much is said about the truth? How, impo how much importance God has placed on the truth? If you continue in my words, you are my disciples indeed, and ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. John 8, 31 and 32. No wonder Jesus said, he that rejecteth me and receiveth not my words hath one that judgeth him. The words that I have spoken, the same shall judge him in the last day. John 12, 48. 
think about those things. Let us be as we ought to be in preaching the gospel and defending the faith. But let us reinforce ourselves and not be led astray by folks who teach that truth is relative and subjective. But let us uphold the absolute objective standard of truth that the Bible is. If you're not a Christian, we've studied many times in this pulpit, and many have taught it, a simple, bold, great plan of salvation, that one must believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, John 8, 24, and that faith comes by hearing the Word of God, Romans 10, 17, that one must repent of his sins, Acts 17, 30, and confess his faith in Christ, Romans 10, 10. Then one's qualified before God to be baptized into Christ for the remission of sins, Rise from that watery grave of baptism, a faithful child of God, walking, as John said, in the truth. If you've wandered from the truth or any component part of it as a child of God, we urge your repentance, your confession of such sin, and prayer to God for forgiveness, that you might walk in the truth until you stand before the Lord in judgment and hear, well done, thou good and faithful subject. Enter ye into the joys of thy Lord. If your subject is invitation, we bid you come while we stand and sing.